truly the Lord is good and his mercy, somebody say his mercy, his mercy. endures forever, amen, his mercy endures forever, amen, and he will not forsake the works of his own hands, amen, amen, and that stuck out to me in our opening scripture this morning, that the Lord won't forsake the works of his own hands, amen, because he's begun the good work, somebody say he's begun the good work, Amen. He has begun the good work. And I want to start giving him by giving him all the glory, honor, and praise today. Thanking him for his son Jesus Christ. Thanking him for the Holy Ghost this morning. The spirit of truth. Amen. Somebody say the spirit of truth. Spirit of truth. Amen. And he did send him because Jesus prayed that he would. Amen. And Jesus said, I pray that I pray the Father that He would send the Holy Ghost. Amen. And I give honor to our bishop this morning, our founder and presiding bishop, Dr. Joseph White. I give honor to our district superintendent, Pastor Jones, Elder Walter Jones out of Bloomington Worship Center. And I give honor to our pastor of New Life, Pastor Demetrius Harris. And I give honor to to all of you this morning, whether in the building or watching online, and God is a good God, and He is um, preparing the church for His Son Jesus' return, and when we think about our lives on a daily basis, and when we look back over our lives, we should think about, especially our life in Christ, um, you know, what, what has our life been for? What has our purpose been for? And Jesus said in 18 and 37 in the book of St. John, he said, for this cause was I born and uh, to this end came I into the world that he should bear witness of the truth. And are we bearing witness of the truth this morning? And um, it's not the way that my, my, my notes are reading, but I just wanted to start off for us to have a thought this morning on our lives in Christ. Because if you're here this morning, your life is and should be hid in Christ today. And uh, as our lives are hid in Christ, uh, what are we doing in our lives as they are hid in Christ? Are we bearing witness unto the truth? What are we bearing witness unto? Amen. Uh, but Jesus said that he came so he could bear witness unto the truth. Amen. And he said in another scripture that the truth shall set us free. Amen. And so I want to encourage you as we go into our lesson this morning, and we're going to be talking about salvation this morning, um, but in order to bear witness unto the truth, we have to be filled with the Holy Ghost. We have to have this great salvation, and the Bible talks about how should we neglect so great a salvation, amen, because the salvation is just not any salvation, but it's a great salvation, amen, and it's, it's what we need in order to make it into the kingdom of God, amen, amen, and so I would ask this morning um, that we turn over to the book of Ephesians, um, I think I want to go to the first chapter starting off. Ephesians, the first chapter. Amen. And we're going to talk about the salvation. We're also going to talk about why we have it. Amen. Somebody say, why I have it. Why I have it. Amen. And over in the book of Ephesians, the first chapter, and this is Paul. Um, and in my... King James Version of the Dakes Bible, at the very beginning of chapter 1, it says, a believer's position in grace. Then it says the church, and then it says Christian living, and then it says spiritual warfare of believers. And every one of the um, uh, chapters starts off with some type of heading. Um, so it gives you an idea of what you are about to embark upon when you begin reading the Word of God. Um, in that particular chapter or epistle. And so Paul here pointed out our position in grace, a believer's position in grace. He then centers around the church 
And then he breaks it down further and talks about fundamental Christian living. And then he goes into the spiritual warfare in the latter part of the chapter. Amen. So in chapter 1, in verse 1, um, if I could have a reader this morning, beginning in 1 and 1. Ephesians 1 and 1. What verse do you want me to read, darling? Um, I'll stop. Okay. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us acceptable in the beloved. Amen. And so we see here Paul, and this is a familiar set of scriptures for many of us, uh, but Paul is bringing this introduction in to identify the saints. Uh, he's coming with a greeting of, 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 to those that are the faithful in Christ Jesus. So he's talking to those who are already saved. He's talking to those who are already filled with the Spirit. He's talking to those who are partakers of these spiritual blessings that are in heavenly places. He's talking about how the Lord has blessed us with these spiritual blessings. He then migrates into how the Lord has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. And he says here in verse 4, he's chosen us before the foundation of the world for a purpose, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And being holy and without blame before the Lord in love is indicative of us walking in the truth of the light of the gospel. It's indicative of us walking according to the calling and the choosing that he has provided for us through predestination. And many might think that, well, if you're predestinated, you really don't have any flexibility to do or say or act or do whatever it is that you want to do, say or act or even believe. But this predestination that we have um, we can choose to step outside of what we've been chosen to do. And just because we've been chosen doesn't mean that we are operating as robots where we can't make a decision to forego that choosing. Amen. Amen. But God saw fit because it says in verse 6 that he had made us accepted in the beloved. He's given us everything that we need in order for us to do what verse 4 says, which is to be holy and without blame before him in love. He gives us the Holy Ghost in order for us to be accepted in the beloved. Amen. And this morning, as we're looking at the word of God, I want to encourage you that you have everything that you need in order to fulfill your predestination. And it began way back when, when you came unto the Lord um, and he found us and we didn't find him. And a lot of times we say, I found the Lord Jesus. There's a song that says, I found the Lord Jesus. But we really didn't find the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus really found us. Amen. And the song sounds good and I like the song, but um, he found us. And the purpose in him finding us was because he wanted us to be able to be accepted in the beloved to carry out this lifestyle of being holy and without blame before him in love. Amen? Amen. And in order for us to do that, he knew that there were steps that had to be taken. He knew that we had to um, make a decision when we were presented with the option of repentance. And I will say that repentance is an option because although the Bible says many are called and few are chosen, you have to make a decision whether to repent or not to repent. And, you know, I'm going back to some fundamental basics of, of the, the foundational elements of 
Christianity 101. But we had to make a decision to repent or not to repent. And that decision led itself to, if you chose to repent, led itself to verse 4 and 5 and 6. Amen? And when we have repented of all of our sins, known and unknown, and repentance is a godly sorrow, when the light of the gospel has been shined upon our soul and has been shined upon our spirit to bring an awareness of the lifestyle and the life that we were born in, which is born in sin, as David even brought it out in Psalms 51, and shaping in iniquity. And when we realize, because before the light of the gospel shined, and I'm going all the way back now, but before the light of the gospel shined on our souls to make us aware of what God thought about the life that we were living and the life that we were born in, before the light shined, we all thought that we were fine. We all thought, because the Bible says that there's a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is what? Destruction. Destruction. And the light of the gospel comes to us in the form of the word by the spirit, and the spirit brings the light of the gospel to us so that this destruction or this path that we're heading or headed down or we're heading down could be cut off. And so that we would be on a new road, it's kind of like this, when you're on a road and the road is about to end. And if you don't take a detour on that road that is about to end, then the end thereof is certain destruction. But the light of the gospel came and comes so that way when we are on this road, we're able to take a detour. And the Spirit points out the detour and he points it out as being believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, repenting of our sins and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know this is basic fundamentals for some this morning, but the gospel foundation has to be laid appropriately in order for us to recognize who we are in God now. And if the foundation of the gospel has not been laid appropriately or properly, then everything that we do after we come to Christ is kind of questionable. It's kind of shaky. It's kind of, uh, it causes us to waver and be like the Bible says, tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine because the foundation of the gospel, the principal elements of the gospel may not have resonated with us or shined on us as bright as we needed it to because we didn't have the fundamental understanding. But I want to encourage you this morning. I want to go over to the book of Acts. We're talking about this, how to receive this salvation, the gospel of our salvation this morning. Because the Lord is preparing us for a greater work. And we have to know that the Spirit of the Lord, He is with us. He's for us. He moves within us. He's going before us. But we want to make sure that the foundational elements are solid so that when we go out and interact and encounter other people, that the message that we bring forth, as far as the light of the gospel is concerned, there is no confusion. Because many people are going to be called into this gospel. Amen? Amen. And over in Acts, the second chapter, actually, I want to start with this. I'm going to start in 2, Acts 2. And we talked about repentance thus far and repentance from a godly sorrow aspect. From a godly sorrow aspect. And before I came into this gospel, into this way, into this ministry, I had my idea of what repentance would look like. I had my idea of what repentance should sound like in a sense. I kind of heard about it a little bit. It kind of kind of skirted the issue. But when the light of the gospel came to show me that repentance was not for an outward show, 
but it was for this inward measure of grace that God was giving me to bring me his way of repentance so that I could do those things that Ephesians talked about, which was to be holy before him in love without blame. Amen. And so over in Acts, the second chapter, I believe I want to start with, and this is, this is after you've repented, and this is the expectation that all believers should have once we have repented of all of our sins. And it's not a matter of just repenting of our sins and just leaving it at the doorstep. But then once we repent of all of our sins, then there is, as Hosea 6 and 3 says, and I reference that quite often, is there's a following on to know the Lord. And how do we follow on to know the Lord? Anybody, before I go on, before I even dive into this. How do we follow on to know the Lord? Yes. How do we follow on to know the Lord? The first way to follow to know the Lord is keep coming to a, um, a church that has the Holy Spirit there. So if you keep coming, then you'll you'll learn. They'll teach by the Spirit. You'll learn the Word of God, um, and also studying for yourself as well. So not just what you hear at church, but then taking what you hear at church and studying that, um, and so forth. So you faith come by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So you have to keep coming to learn what the Lord, who He is, what He has for you, and so forth. And then you receive the Spirit, and then the Spirit helps you as well, because Jesus said the Spirit will teach you all things. So first, keep coming. Then you will learn, receive the Spirit, then the Spirit begins to teach you, and then that's how you follow on to know the Lord. Amen. Anybody else? I think another way to follow on to know the Lord, uh, adding on to what Pastor Harris said, was just continue to be in a state of being yielded. I think a lot of times, um, before we even come into the gospel, just even as children, we, we are taught to obey in the world, I remember times of being in school, you have to obey your teachers, there's all these different people um, that have rule over you before you even, you know, learn about the gospel, learn about coming to church and all these different things. And I think it's important to keep that mindset when we come into the gospel. A lot of times, you know, we hear the word and then we're told all these wonderful things and then we think it's a free for all after that. You know, now I do what I want to do. I've received Christ, you know, now it's time for me to make my decision to do X, Y, and Z, and that's not the, the right way to go. You really have to remain in the state of being yielded. Um, as Pastor Harris said, if you're in a church with people that are filled with the, with the Spirit, you should continue to listen to those people, be able to receive rebuke without being upset, even though it doesn't always feel good. But um, those, those ways help you to continue on to follow the Lord because we just have many you know, examples even in the Bible of you know, people going their own way and like we just read even in that scripture talking about you know there's a way that seemed right unto them but the end is destruction and a lot of times that destruction comes from not being in a place to be able to hear from other people receive rebuke and not only yield to people but yield to the spirit you know a lot of times we i don't know we just have ways about ourselves and even myself included i've seen in different times where you know the spirit will be speaking to me about different stuff and I almost think, no, you know, that can't be true. The smallest thing the spirit moves in, you know, you just think that it's, it's, it can't be, or you always want to think that he's talking in bigger terms. So, I don't know, I feel like being yielded is one of those things that spirit will help you with to continue on to know the Lord in all things. Amen. Amen. And even to stay, take it a step back further, for those who have just come into the gospel, who are those who are um, just coming into the church, Acts 2 is where we all should desire to be. Amen. And as we go into Acts, the second chapter, because in order for us to follow on, and those are very good commentaries, um, in order for us to follow on to know the Lord, the criteria to help us to do that is being filled with the Spirit ourselves. Because in order for us to yield, as you were mentioning, the Spirit has to give us that mind to yield. In order to be in a spirit-filled church, the spirit has to draw us to come into the spirit-filled church and continue to draw us to remain in a spirit-filled church 
where the word of God is being preached in its purest form. Amen. And so the spirit is the cornerstone of everybody's salvation. Everyone who claims the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the key cornerstone, even though Jesus is the chief cornerstone, but the cornerstone as far as our salvation and receiving the gospel and maintaining in the gospel, because Jesus now is at the right hand of the Father, and he's ever living to make intercession, but he sent the Holy Ghost to help us. And in order for us to be helped, um, we have to have a mind to receive the Holy Ghost. Amen. And so in the book of Acts, the second chapter, it talks about the day of Pentecost and the first baptism of men with the Holy Spirit. And this is really a key element to anyone who is going to live a life in Christ. Because the life in Christ cannot be lived without the assistance, the aid, the abiding, the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost only comes after, somebody say after, after. we have repented of all of our sins. He only comes after we have yielded, as Brother Brooks has said. He only comes after we have been in a spirit-filled place that is teaching us and preaching unto us the righteousness that is found in Christ Jesus, that is giving us the light of the gospel according as Ephesians talked about in the first chapter, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That only occurs by the work, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. And we may think within our minds, well, I've heard this before, and this is foundational, and I don't know why this keeps coming to me. But in order for us to maintain not only do we have to have that deep within our spirit, but we also have to have that in order to preach it and teach it and give it to somebody else. Because that's what's going to draw souls, men and women, to be saved. It's not because Paul had said before, he said it's not of enticing words of man's wisdom. And it's not as being sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. But he told them that he came to them with demonstration and the power. And that was via the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. And I know that we talk about the Holy Ghost a lot more than a lot of other ministries that I've ever heard or been a part of. We talk about the Holy Ghost a lot because the Holy Ghost is the power of God to everyone that believeth. And in the Old Testament, and I'll get to, into Acts in a moment, but in the Old Testament, God was on the scene more with the children of Israel. And, and you read all the different scriptures. If you read the Old Testament, it talks about how God did this and God did that. And his presence was with them. And then when you moved into the New Testament, and it doesn't negate the, the, that God is, God is still on the throne. And he's still with us. Um, but the Old Testament was pointing us and showing us about how God worked for the people of God. And then we migrate into the New Testament. And then the, we have the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, and, and Jesus is on the scene. And it was Jesus' time to shine, to show them that the Old Testament was pointing to his coming. And Jesus was fulfilling all righteousness and fulfilling the scriptures that they learned about in the Old Testament. And now he was on the scene. And then Jesus had his time to be there to preach and to teach and to draw them unto him and to point them now unto the Holy Ghost because he knew he was going away. And he wanted them to make sure that they knew that just because he wasn't going to be on the earth any longer, he was going to be in heaven, ever living to make intercession, working with the Father on their behalf. But then he says that he's going to leave them not comfortless, but he's going to give them another comforter because he knew he was a comforter. So he said, I'm going to give you another comforter. And the Holy Ghost is who he began to pass the baton to. God handed it off to Jesus. Jesus handed it off to the Holy Ghost. And now the Holy Ghost is the one running things as far as us being able to live righteously before God. Amen? And sometimes we have to be reminded of that. We're not negating God the Father. We're not negating Jesus Christ the Savior. And we're not negating even the Holy Ghost, but they all work together individual as they are, but they work together as one. And so now we point our attention to what Jesus did 
was pointing his attention to the Holy Ghost because he realized that they needed to know because they were so accustomed to Jesus. And then they were so accustomed to God. But he started saying, no, I need you to think about the Holy Ghost because I'm going to be in heaven. I'm going to be sitting on the right hand of the Father. And God is still on the, on the throne. And he hasn't gone anywhere. But you're going to need to be filled with this Holy Spirit because I need him to lead you because I'm not going to be down there any longer. I need you to be filled with him that he may indwell you so that you can still carry on the work that I came to do. You can still carry on the work that you heard about with the Old Testament. Because the, all of that was laying the foundation for Jesus Christ's coming. Amen? You had a, a remark. It was just in line with everything that you said that this day and age, if, if you went through the, the history and the timeline, and we know that there's a beginning and there's an end in all things. And at this point in time, we are continuing where Jesus left off and where the disciples left off. And, and Acts 1 talks about that. And he left off, Jesus left off before he went back to heaven, telling the people to receive the Holy Ghost. And that then the angel said that he's coming back one day. Mm -hmm. And so since he hasn't came back yet, and the Bible's already written, then we're just continuing doing what Jesus said, which was everyone needs to receive the Holy Ghost to be ready for when he comes back. And so if a church isn't focusing on the Holy Ghost, they're focusing on something else, then they're not actually teaching and preaching and focusing on what Jesus told us to teach and preach and focus on, is that marvel not, we must be born again, and we have to have the Spirit, and we have to do the will of God, and we have to be holy. And none of that can be done without the Holy Ghost. And that's why people that attend this church or people that watch online or they find out that every service and everything in our lives is about the Holy Ghost because according to the Bible, according to Jesus and the disciples, that's what it's all about right now. And when he comes back, then there will be something else that the Bible tells us about reigning and all these other things. But we haven't got to that yet. And that's why we have to focus on what we're supposed to focus on now so we can get to that. Amen. And again, it doesn't negate the fact that Jesus Christ is our Savior because if it was not for Jesus, we wouldn't have the Holy Ghost. We wouldn't even have access to the Holy Ghost. Amen. Right. He prayed the Father that the Father would send the Holy Ghost yeah. because he knew the Holy Ghost was necessary. He had to leave us something. Right. He had to leave us someone because he knew that without the power of God, we could not please God. Amen. And so over in Acts 2 and 1, and this is the Pentecost, the first baptism of men with the Holy Spirit. And it says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And it's something about unity. The unity of the faith pleases God. The unity of the faith causes the Holy Ghost to come in. The unity of the faith causes God to move. When we are all on one accord in this place, the Spirit of the Lord does come in. And if he doesn't come in, we have to examine ourselves. Is it that my mind is over here or your mind is over there? You know, you could be thinking about going out doing X, Y, and Z. And I could be thinking about going to do X, Y, and Z. And you could be doing thinking about doing A, B, and C. And... If we all are not on the same page, of the same mind, on one accord, the Spirit has the ability to decide not to come in. He has the ability to decide that he won't stop by here today. He has the ability to decide, in other words, to give us an extra measure of grace to fall fresh on us, to cause the people of God to receive times of refreshing that come from the presence of the Lord. He has the ability to decide not to do that. Amen? And it says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. That means they had the same mind. They had the mind to worship the Lord. No one was trying to push forward their agenda, but they all had a mind for the, for the Lord to come in by his power. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, 
and it sat upon each of them. And they were all, somebody say all, all, all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit, somebody said the Spirit, the Spirit. gave them utterance. And there are criteria for the Spirit of the Lord to come in. And as you see here, these people had been waiting on the Spirit to come in. They had been doing what was required of them to do. They assembled together in unity. They were on one accord. They were the unity of the faith. They were, they were waiting on the Lord. They had been dedicating themselves to waiting to receive the Spirit. And we have to dedicate ourselves to wait to receive the Spirit so that he may have his way. We've already repented. They had already repented. Had they not repented, the Spirit would not have come in. They were not living in sin. They were not living foul and doing this and doing that. But they had already gone through those first steps that they needed to go through in order for them to be a candidate for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So when the day of Pentecost was fully come, in other words, when the time was right, when, the time was right. when it was the acceptable time, when it was the time that the Lord had appointed, they were all on one accord in one place. And it's important for us to be on the same page in order for us to receive the blessings of the Lord. And the spirit is the main blessing, the main spiritual blessing that we need to receive from the Lord. And it says, suddenly, there came a sound from heaven. Suddenly. It didn't take a long time for the Spirit to come in. Because when they came into the place, they all had the same mission. When we come in the house of God, we have to have the same mission. We have to have the same mind. We have to have the, be on one accord. We have to have the same mind to believe not only that the Lord is going to move for us in the service, but he's going to bless somebody else as well. Amen. Turn with me to over to verse 14. Amen. And this is the time after they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And if I could have a reader starting in verse 14. Acts 2 and 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass, in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Amen. And so you see, Peter had to get up and clarify the matter because obviously they were amongst unbelievers. And he had to get up and let them know that no, I hear what you're saying, but this is prophecy being fulfilled. This was spoken of the prophet Joel. This is what the Lord has for us in this dispensation of time. And he has for us to be filled with the spirit because he knew that we needed to be filled in order to carry on the work. And he had to clarify that, no, it's, it's too early in the day for people to even be drunk. He, said, he had to say, no, this is... This, this is not what's going on, but let me tell you what is ha actually happening right now so that you know that this is fulfillment of the word of God. And you being in this place this morning is fulfillment of the word of God. You being filled and baptized, baptized same is being filled with the Holy Ghost. It is fulfillment of the word of God. And Peter went on further to say, no, I'm going to tell you what, what the Lord said that it was going to come to pass that in these last days that he was going to pour out his spirit. And then he said it was going to be upon all flesh. So anybody who was yielding, who was willing, who was predestinated, who wanted to walk in this predestination, those individuals would have the option 
to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And not only that, but he also gave them the option to prophesy. And when you look at the book of Acts, the 19th chapter, as I'm going there, talking about receiving this salvation, amen? amen. And this salvation is indicative of power. Somebody say power. Oh. Acts the 19th chapter and verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And this is Paul's introduction, introduction of going to Ephesus. And Acts is talking about his journey to Ephesus. And in the subheading it says, Paul at Ephesus finds disciples of John who are baptized in water and the Holy, and it says in, in the Holy Spirit. And they had not yet been baptized in the Holy Spirit, but they had been baptized in water. And it says here in verse 2, And he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? In other words, I know that you've been believing, but I'm here to show you a more excellent way if you have not yet been introduced to this more excellent way. And these disciples had been living as best as they could for 26 years. That's a long time. 26 years they were living off of the baptism that they received in, in, in water and receiving the word of God. And they had been just living off of that. And they were faithfully living off of what they knew. And God is so faithful, saints, that if you don't know the way, and, and you'll read it many times in scripture where Paul would just show up in different places and he would just show up to folk that did not know the light, the greater light of the gospel. And God had assigned him to go to the Gentiles because he was going to be, he could have been a, 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 the apostle assigned to the Jews, but he reserved that for Peter. Right. So Paul ended up being the, the uh, apostle assigned to the Gentile church because he knew that they were so far off. God knew that they were so far off. That at least the Jews knew about God. Because they had been with God in the wilderness. And they had been with God a long time ago. And they knew about Abraham. And they knew about all these different things. And they had been, you know, uh, uh, receiving the, the blessings from the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And they knew that God took them through the Red Sea. And they knew God took them through the Jordan. They knew God. They knew about God. So at least they had a starting point. But Paul was assigned to the Gentile church because the Gentiles were called aliens. And they were far from the commonwealth of Israel, as the book of Ephesians says. So they needed way more introduction than the Jews. Amen. And so when we find Paul here, he's always going to people who God knew needed him the most. And it says here in verse 2, he said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? Paul didn't care about nothing else when it came to certain things as it relates to uh, when he was encountering people. The main thing that Paul wanted to ensure was that the people had received the Holy Ghost because he knew that that Holy Ghost is who changed him. He knew that when he was on that road to Damascus, that the Holy Ghost, by the power, and Jesus Christ had arrested him on that road, but it was via the Holy Ghost. Yes, it was. And so he knew how the Holy Ghost had come in to change his life. And he wanted to make sure that everyone he encountered had the same opportunity to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost as he did. God affords the same opportunity to receive the Holy Ghost. And he sent Paul to make sure that everywhere he went, that same opportunity was presented as it was presented to Paul. Amen. Amen. So he asked them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? In other words, they probably had some conversation, you know, when he was introduced to them and everything. And, and they probably was talking about, you know, I repented 26 years ago and, you know, um, John preached to us and I've been believing ever since. And you got to imagine yourself as far as how they talked. Yeah. And they probably were just having small talk and everything. And Paul just cut through the chase. He said, well, 
I hear what you're saying, and all that's real good. And and I and I understand that John did a work and he laid a good foundation because y'all been holding on to the gospel of, of, of what you believed for 26 years. Y'all been holding on. And I commend you. But then he cuts to the chase and he says, but I mean, right in verse two, he says, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Yes, sir. It, it briefly reminded me of a conversation we had yesterday when we were out handling business and we, we came into contact with a gentleman we were talking to and he said, oh, well, what do you what do you guys do? You know, mm -hmm. I told him we travel mm -hmm. and I said, for the church and also for photography. And his reply was, spreading the word and taking pictures. And immediately it came to me, he must be someone that goes to church. Mm -hmm. For someone that has no knowledge of church or of God, they wouldn't say spreading the word. Mm -hmm. Because when we didn't know, it wasn't the word. Mm -hmm. And so it immediately came to my mind that he is someone that has some kind of knowledge mm -hmm. of God and of the church and of the word of God. And so I can imagine... When Paul found them, because he just, unless the Spirit just gave it to him immediately, he had to talk to them and get a feel of what kind of people they were. Just like us talking to that, that man yesterday. It's like, oh, okay, this is somebody that knows some of the Word. And that's an opening or an opportunity. And immediately came to my mind, was that Scripture? I wonder, has he received the Holy Ghost since he believed? Mm -hmm. Not having even went deeper into that conversation, but that's what came to mind. Okay, he said spreading the Word. And he said it with... With like a joy and an he understanding. Did. It wasn't just uh, spreading the word. He was like, oh, spreading the word. And so that's how it was with Paul in those days. He went somewhere, he saw somebody, and they had a conversation, and he was able to ask them that question. Because Paul's mission and his goal was to make sure that everywhere he went, he laid a spiritual foundation. Yeah. And the Holy Ghost helps you to do that. You cannot lay... The, the, the right type of foundation, and we've been talking about foundations a lot recently, but you cannot lay the right type of foundation, a spiritual foundation, without the Holy Ghost. And so that's why Paul was like, okay, uh, I know that you all have been under this, this uh, John's gospel for all these years, and that's good. And John laid the, the gospel foundation, the, word, the basic tenets of the word of God. But then there comes a spiritual foundation that should be mixed with the word. And that is what really sustains you and causes you to be on your way to heaven. In other words, that's what's going to change your body from mortal to immortality. The Holy Ghost is the change agent. Not only down here is he the change agent, but he's the change agent that takes you from mortal to immortality. He takes you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. He takes you from here to heaven. And so Paul cut through the chase, and he was really happy about the fact that they had something that they was working with. Because you got to have something, you know, even if it's as minimal and as maximum as repentance. And so they had been past the stage where they repented, and they had the word of God in them. But Paul wanted to help them go further, to follow on to know the Lord, to take it a step higher because Paul wanted to ensure that they were on their way to heaven. And so he asked them had they received the Holy Ghost since they believed. And they said unto him, he said, they said, we, somebody said we, we. have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Now I'm going to stay right there for a moment if I can't hover over that. They said we, so not just one of them. All of them said, so we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. In other words, Paul, I hear what you're saying. But the answer to your question from all of us is that we have never heard about the Holy Ghost. And that tells Paul and told Paul rather that since they had not ever heard about the Holy Ghost, they had no power to be able to duplicate the ministry to go further in God. They were at a standstill in God. When you don't have the Holy Ghost, you are at a standstill in God. And when you don't have the Holy Ghost, not only are we at a standstill if we don't have him, but our bodies can't be changed from mortal to immortality because the Bible says that if we don't have the spirit, 
then we are what? None of his. We're none of his. And some might say, well, that's a cruel thing to say, but it's the word of God. And that's why it was so critical that Paul, everywhere he went, he spread the gospel about Jesus Christ, but he also slid in that whole piece about the Holy Ghost. Because we can believe on Jesus, as the scripture has said, and out of our belly shall flow rivers of living water, that out of our belly shall flow is all pertaining to the Holy Ghost. Believe on Jesus, as the scripture has said, is one part. That's what they did. But then the second part, Jesus talked about it, was the rivers of living water, having the Holy Ghost. Why are we fundamentally, going back to the fundamentals, because when people come into the house of God, they are going to need to know why and how we are doing what we're doing. It's by the power of God. It's by the Holy Ghost. They need to understand that if it were not for the Holy Ghost, none of us would be able to make it to heaven. None of us would be able to preach the gospel according to the word of God. Amen. And it says here, and he said unto them, unto what then were you baptized? Paul started digging a little bit further. He said, wait a minute. So you haven't heard about the Holy Ghost. Then what were you baptized in? And he wasn't trying to be critical of them, but he wanted to get to the heart of the matter because there are other doctrines out there. There are other words being preached out there. There are other things out there. But Paul was saying, okay, since you haven't heard of the Holy Ghost, and they said that they had not, then I need to know a little bit more about what you've been taught. What have you been baptized unto? So that I can meet you where you are. So that I can meet you wherever you are. Peter had to meet the Jews where they were when he was preaching to the Jews. That's why on in Acts the second chapter, uh, on the day of Pentecost, he said, wait a minute now. He said, they're not drunk. It's too early in the day for that. Let me tell you the word of God. What happened was they were just, we were fulfilling the scripture because the scripture said that this is what would happen. He had to dispel any other doctrines and beliefs that was out there. And Paul here was trying to understand where they were coming from so he could help them as well. Amen. And he said that, they said, Paul, John barely baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. So he pointed them in the direction of Christ Jesus. So John did a good work, and he didn't dispel the work that he did. And he wasn't trying to, 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 to disparage the work that John did. But he let them know that he said, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him. And that was one of the good things about John. John definitely taught the people that somebody is coming after me. John was one of those disciples that made sure that he recognized that he was not the Messiah. Because some folk got off. Some people got off. There were many that walked with him no more. Jesus said one day that there were some that did not walk with him anymore after he gave them the light of the gospel. They walked with him no more. Amen. But some of them continued to walk with him. Yes. And those individuals believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and they went out and they spread the gospel. Amen? Amen. And so Paul here is saying, because he knew about John's, that's one thing Paul did. Paul was a scholar. So Paul knew about what John preached. He knew to ask the right questions because he knew exactly where John taught from. And so he said here, I'm going back to verse four. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. And then he said that they should, the people, that they should believe on him which should come after him that is on Christ Jesus. Good morning. And he says here, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about 12. So we had 12 people who had been living to the best of their ability, to the gospel of of repentance that John the Baptist, John had given them the foundational elements of the word of God 
in order for them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He had given them what they needed in order for them to get to that point where Paul met them. And God is so good that he will give you what you need in order to get you to where you need to be in order for you to receive salvation. And when you look back over your life and you think about all the things that you've been through and all the places that you have been, and sometimes when I look back over my life, I begin to think about some of the situations that I found myself in. It was the grace and mercy of God that I wasn't consumed. It was the grace and mercy of God that I'm standing here in this place at this time for such a time as this. And these people in Acts, the 19 chapters where we are, ladies, in Acts 19, they had been waiting for 26 years to run into someone who could give them more of the word of God and be baptized in the spirit of God in order for their salvation to be completely whole. Amen. There's always a starting point. Amen. Amen. There's always a starting point. And everybody in this place and everyone that I've encountered, when they talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, you start with where you are yeah. and you start with what you have. But the Bible also tells us, and yet I show you a more excellent way, he begins to give you and put you in places and in positions to receive more of him. Amen. He will make sure that you have who you need and what you need in order for you to receive him. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so when Paul is over in Acts 19... And he asked them about how they received the Holy Ghost since they believed. You know, one of the things that I recognized here was they were not ashamed to tell Paul what they didn't have. They were not ashamed in Acts 19 over in roundabout. We started in verse 1 and then we read down into it. But roundabout verse 2, Paul cut through the chase and had asked them about have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe or the Holy Spirit. They just straight told him. They said, we have not so much heard whether there be any Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. And Paul could work with that. When you acknowledge that you don't have what it is that God is looking for at that time, then God can work with you. And it's, it's kind of like when in, in the world where people say, well, in order for you to have a problem solved, you first have to understand that there is a problem. That was their case. They realized it's like going to the hospital and you go to a hospital and you just show up at the hospital and you go to check in, first thing they're going to ask you is, why are you here today? And when you are asked that question, the expectation of those that are checking you in is for you to tell them what symptoms you are having in order for them to help you. And it's the same thing in God. God draws us by his spirit unto him, unto people, unto the house of God. But when he draws us, he has an expectation of us to acknowledge that we need something from him. And he wants us to recognize it and say it and be not ashamed to acknowledge it. And so what they did here, and they said we had not so much as heard that there be any Holy Ghost, they acknowledged that they did not have what Paul was inquiring about. But they didn't stop there. And I want to encourage you this morning. You may not in your mind say, well, I don't have this. I don't have that. I don't have this. This isn't this, 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 and this. But God isn't looking at what you don't have. God is looking at what he has to give to you. That's what he's looking at. It's not about what you don't have in the current. It's about what God wants to give you in the present. And God has something for everybody in this place. And you may say, well, that sounds pretty general, Sister Pastor Harris. That, that sounds pretty generic in nature. God is very intentional. When Paul showed up here to meet these folks, and they have been living and believing the best that they could for 26 years, according to John's preaching the gospel to them as he, was, as he learned. But after 26 years, and I think about this, 26 years is a long time. It's a long time. How long have you been waiting on something from God? How long have you been waiting on something in your life? How long? But they waited 26 years. And during that 26 years that they waited, 
Not only did they wait, but they didn't give up. When Paul found them, they had not given up on believing in God. Paul showed up to give them a more excellent way. And until Paul showed up, they were still doing the best that they knew how. And you may have been doing the best that you know how for however long you've been alive. But then God shows up. He'll send somebody. He'll send his Holy Spirit. He will send what you need in the acceptable time if you don't give up. And so after 26 years, Paul showed up on the scene. And when he showed up on the scene, these people were not ashamed to say, I don't have what it is that you're asking me about. But I know, and I'm using my Holy Ghost imagination, but I know that when they said that we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost in verse 2, that didn't discourage Paul from imparting a blessing unto them. That didn't discourage them for expecting a blessing from God. You may not have what it is that you think that you should have at this moment in time. They didn't have, because they could have got real discouraged when Paul asked them the question, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? They could have said, you know what? No, I, 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 I don't have the Holy Ghost. I don't have the Holy Spirit slash Holy Ghost, same thing. I don't have him. Might as well just throw in the towel, not worry about it, because I don't have what you're asking me for. But Paul kept on pressing his way so that he could be a blessing to them because he knew that God had assigned him to go see these people so that they could receive what God wanted them to have. When you come into the house of God, God has assigned you to come in in order to receive from him what he wants you to have. It's not about what you don't have. It's about what God has for you. Amen? And so, as we're winding down this morning, I want to go back over, if I could, and I'm going to finish this out really quickly, in verse 5. It says, when they heard this, talking about the people, um, Acts 19 and 5, talking about the, the disciples, there were 12 of them. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit came on them. And they spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about twelve. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Turn with me back over to the book of, I want to, actually I want to turn to Acts, 7, Acts 17. Acts the 17th chapter. We're still talking about Paul here this morning. In Acts 17, Acts 17, and this is still talking about Paul, and over in Acts the 17th chapter, I want to encourage you this morning that God knows what you need, and I want to encourage you that, again, it's not about what you don't have, but it's about what God has for you. Acts, the 17th chapter, and this is Paul on his journey. Paul traveled a lot throughout his ministry, going about establishing churches, going about encouraging people, letting them know what the things that Jesus Christ had put into his hands to give unto them. And it was the gospel of their salvation. And he was going about letting them know as he was establishing churches that it is not about, it was not about just about them, but it was about what God had for them and not just about what God had for them, but what God had for them, for them to give to other people. So God will bless you with the, the gospel of your salvation, but he also gives you what you need in order for you to bless somebody else. He gives you what you need in order for you to comfort somebody else. And we've been learning over in Corinthians, this scripture, and I'll just quote it, but it says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has blessed us, he's the God of all comfort, and he's blessed us and comforted us, and I'm paraphrasing, but he comforts us so that we can comfort others. And so he gives us that for that reason. And over here in Acts, the 17th chapter, Paul has come over to Athens, and I want to start with 
verse 22. If I can have a reader. Brother Brooks, would you mind? Acts 17 and 22. Acts 17, verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill, and he said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands. And though he needed anything, saying he giveth to all life and breath in all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. That, keep, keep going. that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Keep going. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are all also his offspring. Amen. And so Paul here, as I'm wrapping things up this morning, Paul is letting the people know here in Athens because they were looking for God. And they had this inscription on this altar saying unto the unknown God. And many of us, before we came to Christ, we, in our minds, I'll speak for myself, in my mind, he was the unknown. He was unknown. God the Father was unknown. Jesus Christ, his son, was unknown. The Holy Spirit was unknown in my life. And they are three different people, but they were unknown to me because I did not understand that they existed, not only existed, but their purpose in my life. And when Paul came to them, these folks over in Athens, he came to them in the midst of Mars Hill in Athens. And when he saw this inscription, it pricked him in his heart because he began to think, well, I'm here for another journey. I'm here for another introduction. It was a little bit different from what he encountered over um, in Ephesus, when he was talking to the, the disciples that had not heard of the Holy Spirit, this time they didn't know about God at all. The true God of heaven, they had no idea. And Paul said, let me let you know a little bit about the God that we serve. And he said that God not only made the worlds, but he was also in heaven. And he also didn't need anything from us because he came to bless and move for us. And this is what they didn't understand because they were making all these images and all these different idols and all these different things. And that's why Paul started off the way that he started off. Because this land in Athens was a land of idolatry. And Paul wanted to dispel all those things and let them know that the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father were who they should be worshiping. Amen. And it says here in verse 28. Paul got down to it. He says, for in him we live and move and have our being. And he said also that we are his offspring. And Paul was just letting them know that if we would seek the Lord, in verse 27, as I'm closing up, if we should seek after the Lord, he says that happily, if we would feel after God, and when you come into the house of God, you are seeking the face of God. You are feeling after God. You are looking for God. If anybody was like I was before I came to the Lord, I said to myself one day, there has to be more to life. There has to be a God. There has to be a Savior. There has to be someone who's able to change my life and turn it around. And Paul says that if we would seek after the Lord, if we would feel after him, if we would find him because he is not far from every one of us. Amen? Amen. That's all I have for you for Christian education.